I am Vinny Tartarich. Folks, your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent when we start this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean, guaranteed, just like the guy on the other mic. Folks, he's he's been on this show before, and um, it's been way too long. And it's probably been way too long because I don't like to bother these guys. There's a guy I would have on once a month if he'd come on, but I don't want to bother him. These guys are busy. This guy, not only does he have a running store, but he's also a medical doctor. He's an MD. And uh, he works in West Virginia uh, and he runs a family clinic. But wait, there's more. He will also talk to you about diabetes because he has a form of diabetes. But wait, there's more. He will talk about how that uh, correlates with uh, sugar and uh, diabetes and also heart disease. Okay, I think that's all I have on him. Folks, I'm talking about Dr. Mark Kukazella. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing well, Vinny. It's a pleasure to be back on. Yes, it's been a while. It Listen has to been. a lot of your shows in the interim. So it's it has good. been a minute. Uh, Mark, um, did I get your introduction right? I mean, you you are somewhat of a jack of all trades when it comes to MDs. Yeah, I'm trained to be what's called a family doctor, Vinny. They're like the old school doctors that don't take care of parts. You know, they they like to understand like all the parts and how yeah. one part's affecting the other part. Um we're the kind of folks who will answer your phone call on a weekend, you know, come in early, stay late. You know, maybe uh, if you have some chicken eggs, we'll barter you. You know, <laughs> yeah, people bring me that kind of stuff all the time. I'm in West Virginia. Doc, I hear you like eggs and they bring in some chicken eggs and stuff like that. Yeah. But my uh, my clinic here is mostly focused on diabetes, metabolism and obesity. So I have a practice here trying to reverse diabetes in the state which is number one in diabetes. So we got a lot of work to do, Vinny. Wait, you guys are number one? You guys are beating Mississippi and Louisiana? I think it depends on which which survey, whether it's CDC, Robert Wood Johnson, or Trust for America Health. Like they all, we're, we're in the top three, you know, like just like the football poll, you know, you got the different, yeah. the different presses and they all come up pretty close, but we're all we're all doing pretty bad. And I think we can do better. You I know, teach medical students too, which I think is most vital, you know, for any of us now, like the, the next generation of docs, it's, it's a joy to teach the medical students. You know, I think that learn. might be the most important thing that you do personally, because we, we need to get doctors out there who are understanding what's going on. You know, for years, people would say to me, well, Vinny, why do you care so much? I mean, you, you, you're in good shape and you're healthy. And why, why do you care? Well, I have my whole family lives down in Louisiana. And I'm not just talking about my my immediate my nucleus family, I'm talking about relatives and friends and everything else And in Louisiana. It's almost like your friends are your family too. It's not almost they, they are your family. And when you see the people you grew up with, who basically, they were exactly who Bob Seger was singing about in the song like a rock. You know, they were strong as they could be. They were wire. They they were thin. They 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 were strong and they were like a rock. You know, and then all of a sudden you go back home. You know, I go away for years and I go back, and they don't look like a rock anymore. You know, they they're starting to look like a pillow. And when you know, it's kind of like I, I always say, Mark, it's like when the storm was over in New Orleans, right? When when Katrina was over with. People started going, hey, my feet are wet all of a sudden. Wait, wait, uh, water seems to be at my ankle. Oh, hang on. It's up to my knees now. Before you know it, they, they're underwater, right? The levee broke and the water seeps in. And of course, the storm just happened. So you don't think anything of it. You know, it's, your ankles are wet. Now your knees are wet. Now you're swimming, right? And I think that happened because you and I are a similar age. That happened in our lifetime. We, we, you, me, we saw this happening. What year were you coming out of med school, Mark? 1992, graduated med school. So we were probably undergrads. Yeah, we, we were undergrads at around the same time, early 80s, right? Yeah, mid 80s, early nobody, 80s. Nobody was fat back then. Think about it. 
Nobody was fat. I mean, uh, Total used to run a commercial. Hey, if you can pinch an inch, you're too fat. You can pinch an inch. I mean, you're now in one of the obesity capitals of the United States, <clears throat> which means the world. Yes, no. Yeah, I think the I think the Middle East has some higher demographics of obesity, Vinny, than ours, but US, UK, Australia is catching up. In the in those 40 years, so what is it now? 2022. So in those 40 years, childhood obesity has gone up close to 10 times, you know, since you and I, you know, were finishing high school. So the numbers speak for themselves and you know, clearly we're, we're not doing a, a good job. So yeah, as far as yeah. policy, I mean, you can go down the rabbit hole to, is there one smoking gun? Um, Lewis Cantley, who's a wonderful story. He's one of the leading cancer researchers now. Vinny, I'm not sure. Are you familiar with Lou Cantley? I'm not. No, I'm, I'm all yeah, interested. He's a good one to get on the show. So he, he is right now probably the premier cancer researcher as far as the effects of sugar on cancer. You know, all the pathways that are, outside of my pay, pay grade as a family doc. Um, but he, uh, I interviewed him for a book chapter. He was raised in rural West Virginia. And, uh, you know, and I knew he was into this cancer and sugar and he shared his story, which was just like epiphanal. So, you know, he was a young kid in rural West Virginia. Everyone like you and me was fine, right? And then he goes off to college, right? So goes off for like eight years to college, you know, grad school, med school comes back and he used to work in a convenience store when he was like in high school and he comes back and he's like wait a minute like eight to ten years in one generation like everything changed and he'll implicate the sugar like he says right. nope i think it's the sugar it wasn't like well kids are doing less gym class it's like no no there was like he's like it was the sugar because he saw what was happening sugar like the sodas were cheaper than water in these communities you know, you, you could get this stuff for like pennies per, you know, bottles and none of that stuff was available. So he could tell the story better. But then he went on to study that for his whole career. And he's published like two, three hundred papers on the topic, you know, for for those cancers that are driven by sugar. Um, not all cancers. I mean, cancers, probably a million different mechanisms, but there are certain ones that are driven by sugars and insulin and the carbohydrates. And he's studying that right now. You can Lou Cantley, and he was yeah, on. I, I wrote his name down. Uh, if you could get me in touch guy. with him after the show, yeah. I would love to have that guy on. By the way, <clears throat> it's true what what Lou said. <clears throat> I'm already calling him Lou. Um, I was. I just got back, as you know, from a around the world trip of this country, and um, I don't like to drink water from plastic. You know, I don't. You know, I I, I walk around with my. My tin can, you have it over there too. I, I call it my tin can, but it's, uh, it's made of, uh, I guess, stainless steel. And um, because, you know, there's so much, I've had Dr. Anthony J and everyone else on the show saying, whatever you do, do not drink from plastic. Uh, the estrogen, you know, he wrote a book, Estrogen Generation, about the whole thing. And the crazy thing is, is that when I'm on the road, every now and then I'll run out. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a frog in my throat. I'll run out of water and I'll grab a plastic thing of water at the store. And, you know, because my feeling is, well, I'm dehydrating here in the car. I need to get some and I'll drink some of this until I get to where. Yeah. At any rate, I, I'm getting gas. I walk in, I buy a thing of water. I don't look at the price. I just grab whatever it said, smart water or, you know, uh, you know, Purifina, but some kind of some crap. I don't know what it is. I walk up and zoop, and then it, I look at my credit card when I stick the little credit card in the slot because we don't pay with money anymore, right? You know, and I see two dollars and something pop up, and I went, "Wow, ah, two dollars and something for a couple of ounces of water." And then I thought about it, and I told the one I said, "Hang on, I'll be right back." I walked over and looked at the Gatorade much cheaper. I looked over at the Coke and the Pepsi. Everything was less than half the price. Nothing was even a dollar, right? On the That's drink. not even the fountain drink, you know, where you go get the big, you know, fill it from the fountain. Right. But I didn't know what that would cost. I just, I just wanted to yeah, see. Maybe. I had to see. I'm glad you brought that up because Lewis is right. Dr. Cantley is right. 
I paid, I, I'm shocked because I never buy those. I didn't know that's what they cost. You know, I got caught out in the middle of the country somewhere and I wanted some water, right? And uh, so I bought that water and I didn't even finish it. You know, it was during one of my desert legs. My mind goes right to if my car somehow breaks down out here, I want to have water with me, right? So it was backup water. But sure enough, man. And by the way, it killed me at the end of the day. I threw it away. And you will go with them. Why would you throw it away? $2 right there. Well, yeah, just $2 gone. And the, the, and the reason plastic. Is now it's heated up in my car all day. So there's more estrogen floating around in that water, right? So I'm not going to drink it. I could get more water for the next day. And by the way, I'll pack way more water because I'm not going to spend another two bucks. But you're right. Um, water is more expensive than, than sugar, which is crazy. And we're dying from sugar. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that I, I'm an N1 experiment, Mark. You know my story, right? That, you know, a doctor told me in 19, I'm sorry, 2008, stay away from sugars. We're looking at that cancer feeds on sugar. We're looking at that. We're, we're pretty sure that this is a problem. No one was talking about it back then. This was a doctor who was at Cedar sinai in California. She was doing research. She was hearing this, right? This was part of what they were talking about. Where is Cantley on this stuff? Yeah, so he, you can probably look him up. He was actually, he was on Peter Atia's podcast. You probably find that. So he really shares his story. We could put it in the show notes. I, I believe that was this episode where he just told his story. So I don't want to put words in his mouth. But he does, he studies the cancers that are driven by the sugar mechanism, similar to Warburg effect, similar to Sam Apple's book, Ravenous. So a, a lot of those, um, uh, Thomas Seafried uh, up at Boston, Seafried, he also, he has a book called Cancer as a Metabolic Disease. So for those types yeah. of cancers that are driven by specific pathways, that's, he's trying to figure that out. He's a researcher. He's trying to figure that out as a whole lab. And I think he has figured out a lot of stuff that we need to take action on now and not wait for the next study. But that's policy. And you know, it's beyond what you and I can do in rural Louisiana or rural West Virginia, where like you say, Vinny, it costs you nothing to buy a big bottle of sugar, but can't drink the water because the water from the tap is not good or their well is contaminated. And now, like you have a choice between three dollar water or a dollar Gatorade, so yeah. you, you buy the Gatorade, and you end up with fatty liver and you know pre diabetes by the time you finish high school. Yeah, it, it's pretty crazy, and, uh, and they serve it in the schools, you know. So that's the other thing, you know. They, I was just at a at a seminar today. It was called Farm to School, and this school nutritionist was going through what they are required to serve the children for breakfast and lunch. And, and she was even joking about it because she went after me and I said, look, we got to get these kids some protein. And what the only thing that's required is the carbohydrates. So at breakfast, it was like grains, carbohydrate, juice, carbohydrate, chocolate milk, carbohydrate, fruit cup, carbohydrate. That's it. That's, that's what's required. And it's like, wow, 100, uh, I think you could do the math, 100 to 120 grams of carbohydrates wow. at breakfast. And how do and you get kids the are in kindergarten? They're in, and this is government guidelines, right? This is, and, and like people are like rolling their eyes, like, oh my gosh, like, but they're required. So a whole grain, Vinny, is uh, Honey Nut Cheerios would be considered a whole grain. Crazy. And they're required to have two of those servings two services. Yeah, it drives me nuts because Nina just sent me this thing. She goes, here, here are the new guidelines and they look even worse. So we're still going in the wrong direction. Yes, we're I'm going hoping, in the wrong direction. Look, I, I had Thomas Seyfried on the show eight years ago. I, I need to have him back again, you know, because these guys are, are talking about things that no one else is talking about and it would make such a big difference. And it makes me wonder why no one is talking about this stuff. Yeah, the kids don't have a chance. You know, I mean, you and I can make our own decisions. We have a frontal cortex developed. You know, that's a part of the brain that you can make adult decisions. But the poor kid on the free school lunch program, free breakfast program. And then one of the one of the folks in the room is like, yeah, then they all fall asleep. Like an hour later, you know, they get this. Uh, what is it? Scientifically, we call it, Vinny, the carb coma. You yeah. Know, the kids have 100 grams of carbohydrate in their 50 pound, you know, kindergarten body. 
glucose up, insulin up, crash, act up. Um, <laughs> Not all kids, but some, you know, some who are already developing fatty liver at that age are metabolically, they're responding really negatively to, to this. Um, the athletic kid might somehow get away with it, but maybe, maybe, but you see, that's not even happening much anymore. No, no, that's the minority now. Like the majority, yeah. I actually shared this with these teachers. I said, imagine this, like, this is what we're doing to the kids. You know, if you have a class of 30 kids of any, and one kid is failing the test, you can maybe blame the kid, you know, or something's up with that one kid, we got to sort it out. But if two thirds of the class are failing the test, you can't blame the kids, right? There's something systemic in what we're doing to them. And that's what's happening with metabolic disease and obesity in children. Now it's the majority. So we can't blame the kids anymore of any, we can't say, you know, it's your fault, your parents fault, do more gym class, you know, eat more whole grains, like we're, we've tried that, and it's not working. You know, Mark, I was just talking one hour ago, actually, up until 20 minutes ago, I had an hour and a half meeting with a writer. They, they, they I'm working with this writer, because they have me doing something that's coming up. I, I'm not announcing it yet. But I'm working with this writer for the first time today. And um, I started talking about stuff. And I said, you know, the presidential physical fitness test. And he goes, I've never heard of that. I went, no, 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 it still goes on. And I said, How old are you? And he, He's an educated guy. As a matter of fact, he went to Tulane. Um, and he goes, I I've, I'm 32. I've never heard of the presidential physical fitness test. Now, my understanding is it's a program that's still out there. I'm finding people that have never heard of it, right? You know, parents are more interested. And that's what I'm talking to this guy about. I'm trying to bring back the fitness middle class. Parents are talking about Oh, I want my kid in baseball. I want my kid in soccer. I want my kid in this, that, and the other thing. The other half are trying to get their kid out of PE class, right? They're yeah, signing notes to get them out of PE class. <clears throat> we don't have a middle class of people getting fit anymore. And that's what I want this talk to be about that this writer is writing for me, right? And I'm sitting there going, he goes, well, what's the problem? And I said, well, the problem is we're fucked. If you don't know what the presidential physical fitness test is, do you remember it, Mark? Can you name oh, it? Heck yeah, yeah. It was the Belgians, I think, at, at the time, last, I think it was maybe the 90s was the last data I looked at, Vinny. And the Belgians, kids, they compared us against the Belgians. And the Belgians, it was like 80 to 90% of the kids passed the test. And we were like less than 10%. Yeah. And that was that was like back when we were kids, you know? So right. I, I'd have to look up the stat on that. But then I think they just, dropped it because you used to have to run a mile i, I forget all the criteria i, I could tell you some i think they dumbed it uh, they dumbed the test now but yeah what were the criteria to pass you know so like if belgium all the kids all right. pass and all right all so pass. all right so when i was um when i was uh but, 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 but let's say 76 77 middle schoolish right um you had to run the um you had to run a 50 yard dash in x amount of time you didn't have to be at speedster to to do it but you had to run a 50 yard dash you had to do a uh broad jump right where they put a couple of broads on the ground you had to jump over them um at least that's what i thought it was but then we we stopped calling them broads um you had to do the broad jump you had to do x number of sit-ups and you know, and within a certain amount of time, you had to do X number of pull-ups and push-ups. Uh, and the long distance was 600 yards. So it was about, about yards. Okay. It, was, it was less than half a mile. You know, you just had to go around a track like, uh, you know, time and a half, pretty much, <laughs> you know. So that was the whole deal. You didn't even have to run a half a mile. Uh, and there was a few other things. And there, were, there was pride at my school to be the best at it. Right. And I was one of the kids that wanted to be the best. And I would always ask because there were other classes is like, Hey, what did BZ do? Because BZ was one of the guys I knew I, I, I'm competing against my buddy BZ. And it's like, what does Smitty do? And the other guy that was older than me, uh, my, my older brother by one year, I needed to know what he did in the 600 because he was the guy to beat in the 600. By the way, never went on to ever run again. He hated athletics. Fastest guy in the 600. Right? Yeah, just because he was in the middle class. He just was an active kid. 
he was just we were all active kids climbing trees and doing whatever and riding bikes and jumping and running and acting like evil Knievel. But the bottom line is, we all got out and acted like evil Knievel. We did things. Right? Does anyone yeah, know I remember is you bring up evil Knievel. So my, my buddies and I like we we're little vagrants in the neighborhood. So we had those little banana seat bikes. Vinny, you remember those little things? I, so we remember had them. I can still find mine. Yes, we had a creek and, and we wanted to jump. Remember the Snake River? Snake that River failure? Canyon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we would set up a little ramp, go full speed with our little banana seat bikes, <laughs> try to jump this little creek. And we thought we were the shit. You know, we were like, yeah, that's a yeah. boy adventure stuff. We did a thing where, you know, we kept doing them on, you know, the you know the Stingray style bikes. That's what we called them, Stingrays. Yeah. Banana seat bikes. Wins. Um, because, good. you know, and... I remember my brother got three garbage cans. You know, he was able to go over three garbage cans on his banana seed bike. And <laughs> I I wanted to beat him. No helmet, of course. They, they didn't invent those yet. No helmet, nothing. It was <laughs> no nothing. Either. So my buddy had a 10 speed. And our idea was, you know, because, you know, before before they would do the, the evil Knievel thing, they would go, OK. Um, Evil Knievel, the trajectory of this ramp is blah, blah, blah. And Evil will have to get to 92 miles an hour by the time he's at the bottom of that ramp if he wants to clear all of these double-decker buses, right? And they would tell you all of the stuff that Evil had to do. Well, we pretended we were the scientists behind. It's like, okay, in order for me to get four garbage cans, I'm going to need a bike with gears. I'm going to need a 10-speed. So my buddy had a 10-speed. And it's like, all right, I got a bike. now. I'm going to have to get X amount of speed before I hit that ramp if I want to clear four garbage cans. And um, I thought I had the speed I needed to mark. It didn't, didn't, out, didn't uh, work out too well. No, I, I, the back wheel ended up on the top of the fourth garbage can. So as, as it turns out, I didn't get as much speed as I needed. And um, I still have a, a gash in my, in my, shin bone where the pedal you know how the 10 speeds have the pedal and had like little like serrated things in them so you yeah, feel they're like little teeth yeah that went into my shin bone and just and by the way i couldn't tell my mom about this i'm down to the bone as you know the skin goes right over the the bone right there the i'm looking at white i'm looking at white. yeah you, you know and I went, oh, okay i can't show my mom this we literally poured alcohol on it and wrapped it up so that my mom couldn't see it. And I just wore my Levi's for you know the next couple of weeks. But that's the kind of stuff we did. Now, you take that to about uh, my niece is 26 now. She must have been 10 or 11 at the time. She walked out of her house one day looking like a transformer. She had a helmet on. She had elbow pads. She had shin pads. And I said, Charlie, uh, what sport are you going to play? She goes, Oh, I'm going to take a bike ride, Uncle Vinny. And like a bike ride with what's this gear? She goes, Oh, to keep me protected. I'm like, Protect it. Take that crap off. She goes, No, I can't. My mom won't let me ride my bike. We're overprotecting these kids, Mark. You know, we're overfeeding yeah, them. Over I, I, a, I think the helmet is a good place on the streets, but outside of that, learn to ride your bike. You know, I think that's. Yeah, get out and the streets got to be safe. Yeah, you know, people, people drive like idiots now too, and it's a different world. Kennedy it's wrote an article good. in '62, Vinny. It was called "The Soft American." So 1962, he saw this coming. Who I mean, wrote it? Was, uh, JFK. It was in Sports yeah. Illustrated. You know, because he he said, uh, "Live you you need to live a life of vigor." He said, yeah. "You know, vigor." Like in his, and, and yeah. right now we don't have any vigor. Era, era, we need Vega. And, and by the way, he's the one that started the presidential physical fitness. I believe so. Yeah, it was yeah. his initiative because people had no Vega. And, and that was 62. Yeah. It, like, it wasn't the, like any problems like we got now. Yeah, no, it, it's crazy. So but we could talk about the that. exercise part of it all day. And I know you're a big fan of exercise. I mean, on top of everything else, folks, he owns a running store. Uh, and if you saw Mark, he doesn't have an ounce of fat anywhere on his body. How old are you, Mark? I, I, 55. 
55 oh, and and you you're completely lean you're very fit and you have a diabetes problem i mean explain your type of diabetes it's not is neither here nor there diabetes wise yeah, so there's two types of any. There's uh, insulin resistance, high insulin state. So that's like 95% of diabetes now. We would call it type 2 diabetes <clears> driven <throat> by, which should be, it's not a disease, it's a syndrome of carbohydrate intolerance. You know, so when we hear diabetes, I, I wish the two types were not called the same thing. And then you have, so, so the pancreas makes insulin to clear blood glucose. And uh, when your liver's filled, you got to keep cranking out more and more insulin. These are the types of most of the people I see fit in that category. And then there's the other type that doesn't make enough insulin. And then you eat the sugar and your sugar goes high because you don't have any insulin to clear it. So right. that's the type I have. I make just enough that if I stay, I'm on about 20 gram carbs a day. So if I stay just there, that little bit of insulin I make, I'm highly insulin sensitive. So the beauty of being fit is um, if anyone out there is medical, my C-peptide 10, 12 years ago at the time of diagnosis was 0.3, which most people would consider, you know, lifelong insulin at that time. But my body is massively insulin sensitive as a distance runner. So that 0.3 level, if I don't, you know, add flame to the fuel to the fire, and I got my glucose monitor on and, you know, it's, it's not perfect, but it stays, it stays pretty good. You know, my A1C is not perfect, but it's, you know, uh, so I just had a, at the farm to school, I had a little bit of watermelon. So, so this is the, this is high for me. I'm 147 now because wow. I had a, yeah, that was just, that was like a hour and a half ago too. So that was one little, not like a big piece. So I don't eat fruit other than I didn't have lunch with me and it was farm to school and it was right out of a, a garden in the backyard. So it looked delicious. So I had a piece, but I'm done with fruit for the day. That'll come back down. But that just shows you if you don't make insulin, you can't eat fruit, but each person needs to understand themselves. So that's where I am. And that's probably why I'm, I'm lean. Like it, you need it, you need these high insulin doses to, to create body fat. So the, the people developing, as I was developing insulin insufficiency, I was eating like 10,000 calories a day. And if you look at pictures of me 10 years ago, running races, it, like I was not well. I was um, like ultra lean because I was, I couldn't put on any weight. Uh, you know, my body fat was probably down to like three to 4% at the time eating probably eight to 10,000 calories a day. And I just thought I, I need all these calories because I'm, I'm running, you know, like, and I'm a doctor until like you get your A1C back. I was required to get it done because I was military. We get blood tests done. Most guys don't go to doctors, but I was required. And I was just random blood test for my annual physical was in that range, diabetes range. And then, uh, you know, you go and get the whole diagnosis done. But um, you can, if you're in that state, you know, you still like you have a choice, you could, you know, not eat the sugar and see how your body does. And, you know, even if you do need insulin, just need little bits, or you can kind of fool yourself. I mean, you know, the McKenzie's, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, River, very well. Yeah, yeah. So watch Vinny's documentary. Uh, on, on, you know, they, they were in Fata doc, no, which, yeah, they were in the Fata documentary, but they also yeah. did a, a documentary themselves called the Diabetes Solution. So, if, and support them. So, watch that documentary, the Diabetes Solution, and it'll tell you everything you need to know about type one diabetes. And it's a beautiful story. It, it really is. The McKenzie's, um, I wish they would have gone further. I, I've, I've told uh, uh, about the bother. I was like, I wish you guys would have gone further um, because. They could have, the doctors tried to crucify this poor woman um, when she um, put her kid on a low carb diet, you know, because he's a type one. And she was like, well, look, if I put him on a low carb diet, we don't have to just keep giving him this expensive insulin. He doesn't have to be on the roller coaster as much. And they said, yeah, but you're ruining your kid's life. And I look at River now and River, there's nothing ruined about River's life. I mean, elite level tennis yeah. the dudes yeah 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 he's he's just this great kid take um, on the u.s open it, it was fun hanging out with you mark last weekend because you were wearing a cgm and every time you ate something i say mark what do you got there because you i think you drank some wine or there was some we tasted some sugar in the meat that they served us at that momentum in the mountains and i turned to mark and went there's some sugar in this meat mark <laughs> What's your insulin now? Your, uh, what, what, what are you pulling? 
Yeah, <laughs> I was using you as, as my litmus test. Well, it's, it's interesting, though. That's why anyone with diabetes should use a monitor. You know, if you just have just a little, maybe just a trace of some sauce on a big slab of ribs, right? You got fat and protein, and maybe you'd have a little side starch, like a little slab, sliver of sweet potato that with some sour cream. You know, so basically you're like 80% fat and protein. It flattens that. Now, what I did showed you right there was watermelon by itself. Right. You know, and that actually was coming down. It had just watermelon by itself without any fat or protein shot up to 180 and it was coming back down. But that's what we're feeding kids every day, right? In school, 100% carbohydrate. Like almost at breakfast, it's like all 100% carbohydrate. When she was reading the requirements, there was absolutely zero fat and absolutely no protein. It was cereal, juice, fruit cup, chocolate milk. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not making that up. That was what. No, I know. I know you're not. Yeah, Um, there's not even any fat in there. Like even if they had whole milk, which in the literature is better than skim, of course, they would at least have some fat to blunt the sugar. But it was 100% sugar. You know, Honey Nut Cheerios with pour on chocolate milk on top of it have a fruit cup right the fruit you get in school and it's not their fault you know they're trying to feed thousands of kids on no budget and non-perishables you know it's a, it's open the can and it's in the syrup and then they get juice of course which is nothing but sugar but it's it's yeah and they and they, they were all in that room Vinny, because they cared you know like their teachers and their school cafeteria people and they're trying to find a solution you know, within the madness, you know, so all solutions will have to start local. You know, yeah, not gonna, and I'm not, I'm not sure there is a solution. You know, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it, it's curious. You know, yeah, we, 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 were in that small, we were in that small community last weekend, and the room was filled with, I, I would say the mean score of age was 50 or 51. There's people in their 80s. And, um, you know, not many people below the age of 48. And that was a few young people, but the mean score had to be 50 or 51. And I'm looking around going, well, okay, I'm okay with that because kids would have been bored in, you know, a whole day of listening to us talk, you know, they would have just been bored. So yeah, you don't want kids there, but man, the heads of the school should have been there. The heads of of the community. I I don't know if they were there. It was just some people from the community. Was the mayor there? Was the this, was the that? Those are the people that make decisions that can make this stuff work in the schools, right? And they did that little clogging thing at the end. And I take note of everything. These are very athletic young women who were clogged. They did this little clogging thing for everyone else that's listening. Most of those girls had a little weight to lose. I'm just being honest. You know, I noticed that this doesn't play well in Peoria, as they say, but I'm looking at these girls going, okay, these are girls who work out every day. They're moving every day because you can't learn these clogging routines just by accident. These girls are sweating, right? These girls are. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm looking at them going, well, they're not morbidly obese, but they could be a lot better. And these are young girls. It gets set up early, Vinny. You know, when I gave my talk before yours, um, way less exciting than than your talk <laughs> i was showing a lot of stats they were falling data. asleep on me i mean by the time i got there they were like oh, the God, the guy. yeah but yeah. when kids are already medically obese at age six like there's these phases in children's lives where you know once that ship has sailed it's very hard to reverse it so like those young girls who were clogging were probably in high school teenagers but were, if they were victims of school food you know and soda at home when they were five, six, seven, eight years old, like it's at that point, their whole metabolism and their, you know, the adipocytes, the fat cells multiply in these early stages of growth. So, so the kids who are obese at age six, their odds of becoming a normal weight adult are like close to zero. And that's right. terrifying. Like, and now we're trying to do gastric bypasses on teenagers, you know, so mm. that's called downstreaming. You know, we got to go, let's prevent these kids from needing the gastric bypass at age 18. But that's going to, but like you say, Vinny, you want the right people in the room. So I was really kind of happy and encouraged today because school principals were there, 
the head of the cafeteria, the school cafeteria, all the administrators were there. We had two school board members there. Nice. Everyone who's in charge of school food, the dietitian, like everyone in the room there, the farmers were in the room, you know, so like the right people are in the room to try to, you know, like you say, that bottom up. And uh, I'm going to touch base with them all tomorrow because then they have these working groups, you know, so I gave my talk and everyone's given a little bit of policy talk. But then day two of this is they all sit together around the table, try to figure it out. And that's where the real work happens, right? Like, yeah, get the people together and um, we'll see what what comes. I, you know, I said, look, I'll back. I got, you know, I got your back. If you want to go, <laughs> go fight this battle, right? you know, I'll, I'll show up, give yeah. them the data show them the real deal, but they're the ones who are going to make it happen. Mark, I want to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to do a quick ad and I want to get into um, cholesterol, CAC scores and, and on and on and on, because I know you have a lot to, to say there. And, and a lot of my audience is very interested in that stuff because they're hearing stuff from doctors and doctors are putting them on statins and everything else. And it's just not fair. But before we go into that, folks, <clears throat> right now, you could go to um, nsngfoods.com. That's my company. That's where the ultra fat is. We're talking about eating fats and proteins. That's all that's in. Oh, I'm lying. That's the third thing. We have electrolytes. That's right. Fat, proteins, and electrolytes. That's what ultra fat is. It was made for athletes. People are giving it to their kids to go to school and what have you. I'm running a little special right now. Even if you have yourself a, um, a subscription over at NSNG Foods for the ultra fat, if you go right now, buy as much as you want. There is no limited quantity or anything. 20% off by putting in promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y, 20% off one time. Now, I'm going to teach you guys how to cheat me out of money. If you use your account and you do it and you go, well, maybe I should have bought more, use your wife's account. And you go, oh, then maybe I get another 20%. Use your kid's account and then use your neighbor's account. You can only use this for a one-time deal because 20% is a big discount and we can't keep giving it away like that. But I want you guys to get as much as you can because back to school is coming and parents are now putting the stuff in the lunch pail. So 20% discount at NSNG Foods on the Ultra Fat and uh, get it while it lasts at 20% off promo code Vinny. We're talking to Dr. Mark Kukazella. Uh, if you want to hear a great podcast, go listen to the first one we did a while back, a few years ago. It's in the back episodes. Mark, you and I got into a little side. I, I wish I had a mic running the entire time you and I were talking over in uh, Moment Momentum in the Mountains because we got into a lot of different things. And I was asking you about CAC scores and what they actually mean. You started talking about aviation and the Army and people pulling Gs and what that means. Get into some of that, if you don't mind. Yeah, the CAC score, you know, for those of you out there. So what what that is, is a $99 rapid CT scan focused on the coronary artery. So it's like the mammogram of the heart. You know, it's got about as much radiation exposure as chest X-ray mammograms. A very simple test. Um, that test will give you a lot of information if you're a middle-aged man or woman and you just want to know, gosh, do I have any cardiovascular disease? It'll It'll tell you you know, are you a zero score, meaning you've got zero, none. So if you're a zero score, your odds of rupturing a plaque, which is heart attacks or plaque ruptures, little piece of calcium, little piece of plaque ruptures and your body develops a clot. But if you don't have any calcium, any plaque on your arteries, your odds of that aren't absolute zero, but it's, it's remotely, remotely low. Um, so it's a good test to have. I, I ordered, I've ordered thousands of these tests. It was the only test we trusted for military pilots to allow them to, to fly performance planes. Meaning, you know, if you watch Top Gun pulling Gs, like there's a lot of stress. So if you have any calcification on your arteries, you ain't flying that plane, you know? So like a zero score is its own magical place. But if you're someone out there listening and you don't know your score and uh, doc says you have high cholesterol, I'll just take this high intensity statin, you know, the 2018 American Heart Association guidelines say, well, maybe not. You know, we don't know if you have disease or not. So go, go get the calcium score. If your score is like, holy shit, you got a lot of calcium on your arteries, take the statin, quit smoking, get rid of your diabetes, you know, get rid of your stress. I mean, like there's multiple, the biggest risk factor to progress cardiovascular disease is the diabetes, not a lack of a statin, but statins may have a role there. But if your score is zero, 
zero, absolute zero, it doesn't really matter what your LDL is, at least from the data that we have now. Uh, ben Bigman, you probably heard of him, David Diamond, they just sure. published an article released yesterday you know, on this topic. If your score is zero and you're metabolically well with isolated high LDL, low triglycerides, high HDL, but you just have isolated high LDL, there's no data that a statin is needed in that group. So you just have to understand your own individual risk. You know, do you have calcium? Do you have something driving that? What's the role of medication? It's, you know, in medicine, we call it shared decision making, Vinny, and informed decision making. You know, so this is a conversation, you know, that's never the same. And then some people kind of want to know their score. They kind of want to know. And other people are like, no, nah, I don't really want to know that. You know, so we don't just tell people what to do, but we give them information of People go pass a stress test, which doesn't look at your arteries, and they're told, you know, hey, Vinny, you passed your stress test. You're good to go. But you got plaque on your arteries and, and you rupture a plaque. That's on us. You know, I mean, I think this, I think, you know, I think there's kind of two, two types of people in life, they would say, you know, those who are humble and those who've been humbled. You know, so I'm pretty humble in this space, you know, because cardiovascular disease humbles us every day. You know, so... If you're out there, maybe a buddy of yours had this, right? Because it wouldn't be you if you're listening. So half of the presentation of cardiovascular disease is something you don't want. So half of the time it presents like this, called sudden cardiac death. So half of you out there, if you have, that's how it presents, right? There's no second chance for half of the people. And if you've been to a doctor in the last year or two, and they say, oh, you're fine, you take your statin, but they didn't check your score and you didn't know, you, you felt you were fine, and you had a lot of calcium and you have an event, you know, that's on us. We call it sudden cardiac death because it recuses us of any responsibility. You know, we're like, well, just shit happens, right? It's sudden death. Right. But no, it's, I think every single person, so cardiovascular, I know I'm kind of going on here, but cardiovascular disease, you know, can be described like this, right? Like, a, and, you know, you've got like a, an iceberg and you've got like a slow barge moving toward it. And we wait so people are on the iceberg, right? Put stints in them. Right. But if you're got family history, my dad had an MI and bypass at age 35. So I've had my score done every five years since I was about 30. You know, just a knock on wood, even after the stress of the pandemic last year, I was still a zero score. So I, yeah. my, I have high LDL. I really don't care. I'm a zero score. So I'm good to go. I'm not going to take a statin, but that's me. I'm a zero score, but someone else might not be. But yeah, you want to identify it early. So if you're going to have that sudden cardiac death at age 55, and you're 30 years old now listening to this, now's the time to fix the roof, right? When the sun is shining and yeah. figure out what holes you got in the roof, you know, and most. Mark locked up. Right? Statin deficiency. You know, there's multiple drivers. We draw advanced lipid panels, um, which you know, looks for the different subparticles of lipids, ApoB, LP, little a, some are genetically driven, some might be modifiable by diet, some by medications. So like you got to know, it's not a simple thing, right? It's find someone, if you got cardiovascular disease, talk to someone who knows what they're talking about and who's humble. All right, someone so more, just, just for the audience, I want you to put this, as I always say to doctors, pretend I'm in kindergarten and explain, I want you to explain this. So uh, we know that zero is a great score to have. You zero, have zero. Yeah, no calcium. <clears throat> how does the numbers work? Uh, how high yeah. do the numbers go? Explain that. G give us an explanation so people can really understand what you're talking about. And it's very much of any age related. So if you're 30 years old, a zero score. So the progression of plaque, you know, to get any score is it probably has gone already gone through 20 years of progression before you're going to see any plaque. You know, you've got a little damage to this one cell layer thick called the endothelium. That's like the Teflon lining of the blood vessel. You get a little inflammation, right? Smoking, diabetes, stress, air pollution, you know, and, and now these little particles, these little LDL particles, small LDLs can start penetrating, you know, can start penetrating, but there's other mechanism and infection causes inflammation in the blood vessels. COVID, right? We saw that, you know, with earlier forms of COVID. Um, sickle cell anemia, different things can cause damage, different vasculitis so that blood vessel gets injured. And then over time, this the classic presentation of cardiovascular disease is you get a little bit of uh, 
like, we call it like foam cells and mast cells, like inside the lining of the artery before the plaque forms, you start to see some swelling, start to see some swelling. Then you get some soft plaque, which you don't see on the calcium yet. And then that soft plaque creates a little bit of rupture and the calcium is a scar. So by the time you see any calcium, you got a scar. So that didn't happen yesterday. That's a long progression. So zero means like you're somewhere like you don't got anything going on, but you might be like ready to rupture a plaque. So 30 years old and diabetic and you have a zero score, that doesn't mean anything because you're 30. But if you're 80 and you have a zero score, you're good to go because yeah. you'll probably be dead from something else. So what, what does the number mean? So the number means relevant to your age. You know, the older you are, the more odds you got some plaque, you know, and, and the score will give you a percent for age. So, for example, say your score is 100, right. you know, and you're my age 55, you'd probably about 60% of the people would be less than that and maybe 40% higher than that. It'll, get a, it'll give you a number, like, where are you? Just like a bell curve, you know, you want to be, you know, good on this test. You want to be on, right. the, on the good end of it. But the, the relative number reflects your odds of a cardiac event. So I've seen scores up to like 4,000, for example, but really anything zero is, is its own magical place. Scores less than 100 if you're older and you've locked down all your risk factors, you're in a good place because all that tells you is your cumulative cardiovascular burden up to that point in time. So say you're a guy my age, Vinny, and you're 55 and you've just read your book and you got rid of sugar, you found religion, and now you're like this healthy human specimen. But for 30 years of your life, you live like shit. Right. You know? <laughs> right. And I have a calcium score of 200 now, like for example, but I've just locked down every single risk factor. So I'm going to stabilize that plaque because whatever it was, you know, I was eating sugar, smoking, stressed out. And that calcium, you'll hear people say, well, maybe it can go away. And most of the time it doesn't. It's like a scar. Like it, it's, huh. it's there and it's not going to go away. You just want to stabilize it, right? Like a scar, just stabilize it, stabilize it, stabilize it. You know, so I think the important thing if you're listening is if you're middle aged, you got any risk of cardiovascular disease, family with cardiovascular disease, and you think you're fine, you don't know if you're fine until you look at the arteries. You could be super fit, but not healthy, right? You could be super fit. Fitness has... Fitness is a different thing than do you got plaque on your arteries? Well, uh, you know, so when you said that to me a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago at, at the event, I took note because the day before that, maybe a couple of days before that, you know, I do these consults and I tell people during the consults, look, you can ask me about calcium and you can ask me about cholesterol, but I can't really answer it in any meaningful way because I'm not a, a medical doctor at all. And this guy goes, well, he goes, can you answer this? And I said, well, try me and I'll see what I can do. He said, well, um, my his, his total cholesterol is around 200. He told me that the doctor said the LDLs and HDLs were, you know, the ratio was fine and all this. But he goes, doctor told me I had a calcium score of five. And um, he said, uh, doctor wanted to put me on a statin. What would you do? And I said, how um, old? How old oh, he, he was 50 or 51, 50 ish. Yeah. And I, I said to him, I said, look, I can't answer that question, but I would get a second opinion from another doctor because yeah, it's a great. It's a, called shared decision making because we don't know, you know, where they say predictions are difficult, especially about the future. Yeah. You know, so so yeah. what is this person? He's 50. So I, I would be worried about this person's 30 year risk, not his 10 year risk, right? Because he wants to right. live to 80. And I would have to look at the whole picture. So I wouldn't want to lend an opinion. If he was smoking and diabetic right now, I'd say, forget the statin, get rid of your diabetes. Yeah, yeah get rid of that. But you see, I don't think he was a smoker. I, I mean, a smoker yeah. and a diabetic would have much more than a five, right? I mean, I don't know. Oh, yeah. I'm just, I'm just, get, most, I'm, just I'm, I'm spitballing here, but. The data says less than a hundred, there's no benefit from a statin and 10 year risk. So that data is the guy's Mitchell. But if you're 50, you actually worry about your 30 year risk. And no one has that data because no one's going to study people for 30 years. Right. So this is where 
and you'd have to look at his lipid profile. And I would get what's called an advanced lipid panel. Like, does he have small LDLs? Like, I, I told him that, and I gave him a doctor to call. I said, call Trochalasi. And now I'm going to start sending people to um, Avadia because yeah, they, they want to. Yeah, yeah, he's down they, there. They in Florida. He sent him to me up the road. I'm three hours up the road from you. Perfect. Sure, I was thrilled to. West Virginia, I'll see him, Vinny. You know, it's, well, but you see, these people are all over the country. All over and, the country, yeah. You know, I got to find doctors who are. You know, I know Tro is in forty-one states now. Uh, Avedia told me he can see almost anyone. Yeah, they uh, West man, can only see people near him. So uh, you know, I have different, but it's good to know I have a West Virginia guy now. Whenever I have that, I'll just send them to you. Um, yeah, it's, um, near where you are, they can drive. I see people they because they want they want to have a conversation. They don't want to be told by a doctor what right. to do. So right. we have a conversation about it, and like let give them the information, give them stuff to read, and everything has trade offs. And I let them decide. Yeah, no, I, I'm more than happy if if you got the room to take these people, I'll start sending them your way because I run out of doctors. You know, I, I do these consults every day, five days a week. And one yeah, third yeah, or maybe yeah. even one half of them, I need to say, hey, go see a doctor. Don't take my word for it. Go see a doctor. Yeah, most doctors don't even know about the calcium test. Like, right. They, they don't know. It. I mean, for example, I saw a patient Friday who sought me out, uber well, 71-year-old lady with on low-carb diet, lost 40 pounds, feels great, has an isolated LDL, about 200, HDL you know, near 100 triglyceride low, you know, not on any medicine, you know, who'd been bullied for years about taking a statin. And somehow, I mean, may think maybe she heard me on a podcast or something. So had never had a calcium score. So we ordered one, and she was zero. So here she's 71. She's had this high LDL her whole life, which is genetic, and she's zero. So pretty good odds, she's going to die of something else before she has cardiovascular disease. Yeah, a a bus is going to hit her. I said, yeah, like, I, I, yeah, Mark, she's I don't zero, 71. And she was grateful. Like, she's like, thank you. I don't want a statin. I was like, you don't need one. If you want to take one, great. But it might have more side effect than good because you don't have any risk of cardiovascular disease. Did you hear the podcast where um, I, when I first moved here, my wife says you need a general general doctor to go to and the whole thing. And yeah, you know. <laughs> And I went, you know, my triglycerides were like 35 or 40, which is unheard of. Low. And, yeah, it's like super low. And um, my LDLs and ACLs perfectly in line. She thought my cholesterol was a little high overall. And uh, on my chart, it showed that I had a CAC score of zero. And um, it showed that I'm, I was 58 because I'm 59 now. It was about a year ago. And she goes, um, I, I need to put you on a light statin. A light, I don't even know what the fuck that means. A light statin? Is this like a Miller light? Is this like, like a, a light? Ultra or something, beer or something. Yeah, I'm like, uh, a light statin. And why? And she goes, well, you're, you're overall, she goes, you're not in danger, but you're overall. I said, Doc, first off, I didn't know I was being tested. I didn't study for it, which means I ate that morning. No one told me I was taking a, a cholesterol test. I'm supposed to take that completely, you know, fasted. Number two, um, I know what my cholesterol numbers are, because I've been tested li right, left and center. And I know that I, I have no issues there. Um, I, I know you I know you didn't test me for small dense particles, because no one knows how to read them. So you didn't test for it. And you're telling me to go on a drug knowing because you have my chart that shows a calcium score of zero. And she goes, I think you need to find another doctor. And I said, I'm, I'm way ahead of you. You were already fired. And I hung up. You know, I, I, I mean, anyone who didn't know would have been scared and just gone on to a drug that can cause other problems. What say you? Yeah, I mean, clearly, there was not a lot of insight there about what the calcium score meant, what your risk was, you know, that you had healthy blood vessels. And, uh, you know, there's no such thing, Vinny, you know, when people say there's good and bad cholesterol. That's a fallacy because the cholesterol is all the same. There's no good or bad cholesterol. The cholesterol is all the same. They're just packaged in different boats and cars driving through your blood vessels. And if you don't have any injury to your blood vessels, you're just moving cholesterol around, which is for energy repair or brains. Like you're just 
the body's doing its work. It's doing its evolutionary housekeeping. So it's not a problem. Cholesterol is not a problem. It's without it, we'd be dead. Patterns of cholesterol are like at the scene of the crime, but they're not the murderer. You know, you probably multiple people have told you that. Yeah. But that's why people need someone who's really educated in all aspects of this. And I, I, I wouldn't claim like, I mean, I think I've got 30 years of knowledge in this space, but I'm reading every day. I mean, no kidding. I just last night read Ben Bigman's article about, you know, the uh, isolated LDLs and otherwise well people. And he had like 10 references about the calcium scores in that article as kind of as you and I are talking about, that's the tiebreaker. You know, do you treat it or not treat? If your calcium score is zero, leave these people alone. You know, yeah. certainly at middle age or later, people who are 30, different deal. People who have diabetes. So if you have t- type two diabetes, all bets are off. So, so maybe I'll rest on that, right? So if you have type two diabetes and you think just because you have a zero score, life is good. No, no, you got to lock down the type two diabetes because your, your progression is very rapid at that, at that time. So if you develop type 2 diabetes at age 40 and somehow you get a calcium score at 45 and it says zero and you think you're like that fighter pilot who's you know, like Tom Cruise, who's a zero, like, no, no, that's not you. You're going to progress much quicker than the, like you, Vinny. If you're zero and you're living the way you live or if I'm zero, I'm not too worried. I'm going to yeah. rapidly progress. You know, I'll keep my diabetes in good control other than that watermelon today. But that's a one off back to yeah. some ribeye tonight and had eggs for breakfast and rinse and repeat delicious. Well, you, you're certainly doing all the right stuff, Mark. And um, I love having you on the show. I know you're super busy. I don't like to keep doctors very long because I know you guys are out there doing the Lord's work. So I want to thank you for coming on. Appreciate um, you having me, Vinny. It was great to meet you in person. Yeah, Just you know, I, your story and have a glass of wine with you. Yeah, and and by the way, we sipped we sipped on some wine. Yeah, all that more. meat, all that we had dry farm wine and all yeah. that. We had like six kinds of meat. That was some good I, stuff. I drank a half a glass of wine because um they, they were serving the dry farm wines, and I didn't want to be rude rude. Uh, and I had to drive. Yeah, you know, I had to drive back home. So I was like, okay, just put a bottle of wine, put put some wine in my glass, and then I turned to you and I said, hey, Mark, you drinking that wine yet? You go, oh yeah, I drink. It's like measure your thing again i need to see where he's always yeah, using dry, your to dry to dry red me. is yeah. good yeah not a problem yeah, it was, it, and, and you told me it didn't move the needle and i i drank about a half a glass of it and uh, it was delicious wine i just can't i'm not going to drink and drive and i knew i had about an hour before i got in the car so i i sipped some of that and called it a day um yeah mark whenever you want to come on you're, you're welcome to come back please come back sooner than later uh, also, I'm going to ask you on the air, please talk to Lewis Cantley and um, hook us up because I would love to have that guy on the show. And um, as a matter of fact, I, I just wrote down Ben Bigman. He hasn't been on in about eight months. I need to bring him back if he's got a new paper out there. Um, want to get these yeah, guys. I'll share that paper with you. It's good paper. Good. It explains a lot about the CAC. Hang on. I want to talk to you off the air, folks. Uh, Villa Capelli Olive Oil, the longest running sponsor of this show. You can drink this stuff straight and check your CGM and it will not go up one iota. It might even go down. <clears throat> you want to talk about something good for your heart. Get a lot of, um, I call it the best fruit juice in the world. It's olive oil. Go get Villa Capelli. You want to save money. You'll find Villa Capelli at VinnyTartars.com. Go, or you could go straight to VillaCapelli.com. When you get to checkout, put in promo code Vinny. You'll get 10% off every single time. Villa Capelli olive oil. Love them around here. You will love them too. Go check out Dr. Mark Cucuzella. You can find him at Mark. Where can they find you? I have a website that links to a lot of stuff. My store at Direct Races is called drmarksdesk.com with an M A R K S, drmarksdesk.com. And you can even, I think there's a contact us there. So if you click there and you want to send me a message, you know, I'll try my best to get back to you. So find me there. Come out and to West Virginia, run some of our races and hang out. It's good country up here. It is. It's beautiful up there. I need to get there and do some skiing next uh, this coming winter. Main Valley's got some good skiing. Pretty yeah. Close to Vinny. Yeah. Good. I'm going to start hitting that because I can't just run out to the West every time. I'm so spoiled by the West when it comes to skiing. And I, it's just expensive it's like as hell to go from here. 
go weekday. You know, if you can get up up there on a weekday when all the kids are in school. Yeah. The place to yourself. Oh, absolutely. I, I can I can pull that off. Dr. Mark's desk. Go check that out. Dr. Mark's desk dot com. M A R K. No C. M A R K S desk dot com. Go check it out. Um, you know what to do. We all go shopping on Amazon. Before you go to Amazon, go to vinnytartarace.com, click through the banner. It puts a little coal on the fire, gets my train down the track. On behalf of Dr. Mark Kukazella, my name is Vinny Tartarich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm. <laughs>